I want you to try something. Pick up your phone and hold it in your hand. If you're watching this on your phone, obviously you're already doing that, but just grab something and, and hold it. Right now, you are exerting more force on that object than the entire planet Earth. I mean, think about it. Every time you pick something up, lift it off the ground, jump up in the air, in that moment, you are stronger than the entire planet. Because in many ways, gravity is actually the weakest of the four fundamental forces. The electromagnetic force, for example, is so strong that this tiny little magnet can outpower the entire planet. And the strong nuclear force is so strong that if you pull two particles apart in an atom, you basically get an atomic bomb. But the strong nuclear force only works at an atomic level. The electromagnetic force in this magnet stops working after just a couple of centimeters. But gravity? It keeps the moon from flying away. The moon. 73 quintillion metric tons of rock over a quarter million miles away. Gravity works in vast scales of distance and size and even time. Gravity is the force of the huge. And over time, our understanding of gravity has changed dramatically, but there's still a few things we still haven't figured out. Things like, you know, how it works. Of all the fundamental forces, gravity is the one that is most fundamental to our experience of life on this planet. We've always known that what goes up must come down, we just never really knew why. Aristotle believed that objects fell toward the Earth because they wanted to go to their natural state. Because Aristotle was wrong about everything. Galileo proved that objects fall at the same rate regardless of how heavy they are and that they fall at a constant acceleration, 9.8 meters per second squared. Sir Isaac Newton was the first to figure out that gravity is an attractive force between objects with mass, and he created the equations for gravity that we still use today. Then Einstein redefined our understanding of gravity as explaining it as a curvature of space-time caused by objects with mass. This is usually explained two-dimensionally, like if you put a bowling ball in the middle of a trampoline, which works pretty well to get the concept across, but it's wildly inaccurate, because we don't live in a two-dimensional universe. A better representation would be something like this, with the planet bending space-time in all directions. And if you can imagine this extended throughout all the objects of the solar system, you get a good idea of just how malleable and clumpy space-time is. Like, we always think of space-time as this flat plane that extends throughout the universe, but that's not how it is. It's actually a lot more bubbly and soupy. No space time for you! One of Einstein's big breakthroughs was what he called the equivalence principle, which is the idea that if you were accelerating at the same rate as a gravitational constant, it would feel to you just like gravity. Now this is one of the things that flat earthers claim explains gravity on a flat earth, that the flat disk of earth is actually accelerating upward through space at 9.8 meters per second squared. And that's why we feel this downward force. But if you started accelerating right now at 9.8 meters per second squared, you would reach the speed of light in 354 days. It's less than a year. And since nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, that theory's pretty much out the window. Unless you've decided you don't believe in the speed of light either, which is just yet another easily provable thing that you've decided is a giant conspiracy. So let's say gravity is about mass. Well, Vsauce did a great video where they talked about how on a flat Earth, gravity would cause the experience of traveling outward from the center of that Earth to be like going uphill because the angle of that force would be pointing back down towards the middle, which would make living on a flat Earth more like living inside of a giant bowl. A bowl that would cause all the water on the planet to pull towards the middle, which is clearly not the case. Gravity as we experience it is simply impossible on a flat Earth, which is just one of thousands of reasons why the whole flat Earth thing is ridiculous, so if you do believe or subscribe to that, please just stop. Just stop. Now a common misconception is that gravity doesn't work in outer space because we always see astronauts floating around in zero gravity. And if you're anything like me, then you grew up thinking that the further away you were from the surface, the less gravity affected you, which is why astronauts got to float around all cool like that. But that's not how this works. That's not how any of this works. The reason these astronauts are floating is because they are in orbit around the Earth. And orbit is basically a state of always falling. The best description of orbit that kind of clarified everything for me was actually Sir Isaac Newton's first thought experiment that led him to come up with the idea of orbit. And he basically imagined that if you could fire a cannonball far enough, that it would eventually fall along the curvature of the Earth. If you fired it further and further and further, it would eventually go all the way around the Earth. And if you get that ball going fast enough, then the gravitational pull of the Earth would only cause that ball to follow around the curve of the Earth, meaning it would continue to go around and around in orbit. So being in the ISS is basically like being in an elevator that's constantly plummeting toward the ground. Fun! 
So now that we've dispelled some myths about gravity, let's get down to the nuts and bolts of it. What actually makes this work? Well, we know that gravity exists between objects with mass, so first we need to know what gives these objects their mass. Now this is what the big deal was about the discovery of the Higgs boson back in 2012. It was also known as the God particle because without the Higgs boson, particles don't have mass. No mass in particles means no mass in atoms, no mass in atoms means no molecules, which means, you know, nothing. Now the Higgs boson itself was actually just a tiny piece of the Higgs field, which interacts with different types of particles in different types of ways, giving them their mass. But as Veritasium explained very well, this doesn't account for all of the mass of the particles, and it also doesn't explain why they're attracted to each other. Now some people, including myself, mistakenly believed that the Higgs boson was sort of the force carrier for gravity. Because if you look at the standard model of particle physics, all the other fundamental forces have force carriers that facilitate those forces. And these force carriers are called bosons, specifically photons, gluons, and W and Z bosons. But the Higgs boson is actually the force carrier of the Higgs mechanism, which is a totally different thing. And I was wrong about that. I know, go figure. But because all the other forces have force carrier bosons, it was assumed that gravity would as well. And that theoretical particle was called a graviton. The graviton, if it exists, would be massless because it works over unlimited distances. And it would also be a spin two type boson, also known as a tensor boson. Now it's been theorized that a massless spin two field would give rise to a force that's indistinguishable from gravity because a massless spin two field would couple to the stress energy tensor in the same way that gravitational interactions do. What is a stress energy tensor? It's the source of the gravitational field in Einstein's field equations on general relativity. It's a tensor quantity in physics that describes the density and flux of energy and momentum in spacetime. Now, do I have any idea what I'm talking about right now? <laughs> no, I do not. But the gist is that the graviton would merge general relativity and quantum mechanics, which would be awesome if we could ever find it, which we haven't. Gravitons also cause problems with a mathematical issue called renormalization. Renormalization is a collection of techniques in quantum field theory, the statistical mechanics of fields, and the theory of self-similar geometric structures that are used to treat infinities arising in calculated quantities by altering values of quantities to compensate for effects of their self-interactions. You know, that old chestnut. Some have tried to merge the supersymmetry found in string theory with general relativity with what they call supergravity. In the 80s, a theory called Modified Newtonian Dynamics, or MOND, tried to explain the movements of stars and galaxies without having to resort to dark matter. Later in 2004, MOND got modified further to create tensor vector scalar gravity, which relies on a relativistic Lagrangian density that maintains the law of conservation of energy. Another popular idea is Eric Verlin's entropic gravity, which argues that gravity is not a fundamental force at all, but instead it's an emergent phenomena that comes out of entropy itself. Now you can forget the chameleon particle theory that has a variable effective mass that's an increasing function of the ambient energy density, which means that its mass changes to cause different reactions to other particles around it. Now, do I understand what any of these things mean? <laughs> no, I do not. But I've got links in the description below if you want to go judge for yourself. Understanding the mystery of gravity is not just about figuring out why things are attracted to each other. It gets to the very heart of the divide between general relativity and quantum mechanics. So ironically, the first force that we were ever aware of turns out to be the very last one that we get a full understanding of, and one that once we do get a full understanding of it, could open up all the secrets of the universe. All right, which one of those is your favorite theory? And which ones did I leave out? Which by the way, I know I left out a lot in this video. So comment on those down below. Now, before I close this thing out, I've got to ask real quick. Did you notice a shirt? Did you notice? The shirt? Yeah, a couple of months ago I was on Reddit and I ran across a post where this guy was sharing his t-shirt designs and they were all so cool. They were just clever and fun and sciencey, and I was like, oh my god, my audience would love this. So I reached out to him. His name is Mikhail, I think I'm saying that right. He lives in Prague and we got started talking and yeah, we're working out a collaboration. So if you want to get a shirt just like this or any of his other designs, I'll put some of them here. He's got some really cool stuff. He's got a page set up just for Answers with Joe viewers. You can get there by going to answerswithjoe.com slash shirts. So yeah, if you see one that you like, and I guarantee you will because there's some really cool stuff over there, please order one. It helps support this channel, helps support a really cool designer over there in Prague, and uh, you get to look as cool as I do. I mean, come on. Big thanks to the 140 supporters on Patreon who help keep this show going. I really appreciate your report. I want to give a quick shout out to the people who just joined recently. That is Chris H., Christopher Cannon, Roman Geber, Scott Brandenburg, Far Frederick Skulin, Buddha Joy Meditation School, and Brian Cherm. If you would like to join them and get some cool free perks uh, along with other stuff, 
just go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. And as always, this video is brought to you by Canker Boy. If you get regular mouth ulcers and canker sores, there is a solution. You can find it at cankerboy.com. Now like, share, and subscribe if you're new here. And by the way, if you're not following me on my social media channels, you might want to do that because this month in September, we're celebrating the 50,000 subscriber mark, which is so cool. I'm going to be reposting my 20 favorite videos over the last few years, and it's only going to be on my social media. So if you're not following me there, you might miss out. So you can follow me at Answers with Joe on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. And I'm also going to be reposting those as podcasts. So if you're not following me on the podcast, you might want to think about doing that. You can find all those at Answers with Joe slash podcast. All right. Thanks again for watching. You guys go out there and have an eye-opening week, and I will see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.